Hey, Joe. So I want to thank you for being willing to talk about your experiences with flying. So sure. What would you like to share with people who are running into the same kind of problems that you ran into? Um, so the best thing I can say to someone is you have to take that leap of faith. Uh, one, one quote that I, uh, have shared with you in the past was, uh, you'll never live if you're too afraid to die. Yeah. So I got to a point where I said, you know what? I'm being limited by not flying for over 10 years and the things I want to see. And I was in my uh, mid twenties uh, before I decided I needed to do something about not flying and um, did a bunch of research on fear of flying. And of course found your website. Um, that was about 10 years ago. And uh, we talked uh, originally, I did the program, the training. And then, as you know, my, my uh, piece that helped a lot was getting to talk to you as a pilot and breaking down every single piece, as you know, uh, of how the aircraft works and the backups and safety and all of that. So um, not only does the program work magically, but for a person like me who likes to know technical information, you being a retired pilot, obviously, uh, is the icing on the cake. You're into mechanical stuff with sure. the kind of work that you do. And so, and, and cars and snowmobiles and who right. knows what. <laughs> right, right. Anything okay. that goes fast. So it's kind of odd that the, uh, the airplane was the biggest issue for me when it's the most powerful of them all. But I, I'm, in fact, uh, on that last flight uh, last month coming back, um, you know, I've been flying fine for years now, but uh, for the first time since I was a kid, uh, I loved, loved every single aspect of the flight, including takeoff. And that's the part that would still, you know, get me a little revved up or maybe I wouldn't look out the window. And now I just, as soon as, you know, the, I hear the throttle spooling up and uh, I'm pinned to the seat, I'm looking out the window like I'm a kid again. So that's pretty unique. That finally just happened now. Again, I could fly fine for years after doing your program, but to say I enjoyed every aspect of the flight that that's pretty amazing when we talk about speed and i know the, the things you like to go fast on you're in control right when somebody else is in control is that the thing uh that's part of it and that's why meeting the pilots uh as you suggest is is crucial i think because um, the anticipatory anxiety occasionally still is there the night before the flight or even when um, you're uh, on your way to the airport, not, not so where it's uh, causing me anything remotely close to thinking, oh, maybe I, I shouldn't take this, this flight, nothing like that. But you know, you just, okay, you're doing something that's non-routine. But as soon as you meet the pilot, whether it's as he's walking in the jetway or as soon as I get on the plane, it's instant. Everything clicks and from the, from the moment I leave the cockpit to take my seat, I have to do nothing but sit back, pick a movie, and, and wait to get to my destination. As you're saying that, I'm thinking before you meet the pilot, you're looking at a situation where you're giving up control to somebody you don't know, and that doesn't seem like a good idea. Right. And then right. when you meet the person, you must have good antenna to sense that this is a person that uh, I'm willing to take over control. Their confidence and their, um, a lot of them will give you background. Uh, I, I, for instance, you know, I always choose a good airline. My airline of preference is Delta. A lot of them are ex-military. I tell them about your program. I tell them how you're ex-military as well. And um, they're intrigued. They are friendly. They are informative. Um, and they're just so confident. And I tell them uh, all the time, you know, yeah, I'm here. So I'm an anxious flyer or ex anxious flyer. Uh, but to them, it's routine. They're doing their job. Their job is to fly the plane, just like somebody else would, a taxi driver would drive a, a cab or a bus driver would drive a bus. Um, but this is highly scrutinized and kept safe and the rules and regulations. And at the end of the day, these pilots want to get home to their families too. So seeing their confidence and how this is a run of the, run of the mill routine thing for them. In fact, one ex-military pilot one time jokingly, he said, um, uh, he had told me he had flown in Iraq and 
and he flew during Desert Storm. He had, you know, flown in several wars. And he goes, well, I anticipate this flight to go pretty smooth because nobody's shooting at us today. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, so, yeah, absolutely. Meeting the pilots and seeing how confident they are um, is a tremendous help. Um, and that's how I'm able to give over that control and trust that these guys are going to get the plane up and down safely. I've had this question from clients, you know, after they do the course, they meet the pilots for three or four or five flights and they, they say, you know, they find this a little embarrassing or something. And so they, they say, is it really necessary? And, and I don't know that it's necessary for everybody, but you stuck with doing that, right? Yes. I stuck with doing it because why break, why try to, fix something that's not broken or why try and uh, do without it. Um, I like it. Um, I think it, it gives you that sense of getting to know someone, seeing their confidence. I like to ask questions about what the weather will be, what to expect, power reduction, um, any turns. And, and maybe I'm just getting lucky, but almost every time I've flown, you know, there's really no complaints about the weather from the pilots. Hey, you know, there's something over here, but we'll go around and if you remember the last time I flew uh, about a month ago and I had called you because uh -huh. I said, Hey, there's uh, going to be thunderstorms all over Miami. And uh, he said, just, just get on the plane. Don't worry about it. And I did. <laughs> yeah. And I talked to the, the pilots and they said, Oh yeah, no, we'll pick through here. And just in case we have this alternate airport. And you know what? The, the, the slight worry that I had, even though I haven't had worry in years uh, flying into or around or through any weather, Again, the worry was all for nothing because even though the flight, yeah, had some bumps here or there, I was fine the whole time. Take well, that's, off, cruise, landing, everything. Just yeah, do it. Yeah, that's one of the things that bothers a lot of people is the turbulence. Did that bother you before? Before the program? Yeah. It stopped me from flying. Yeah, because when the plane drops, it's like you get stress hormones. It drops Absolutely. again and again and again. The stress hormones build up and it's like Absolutely. it drives you up the wall. But now what happens when you're in turbulence? I've done the training so many times that I've dissected every piece of turbulence and added it to, you know, the, either the, the um, uh, emotionally safe moment or the, the afterglow moment. Uh, I've linked it so many times, but I've broken it down to imagining a cartoon character on the plane, what the turbulence feels like, what it sounds like, what the cartoon character is feeling. I link it to when turbulence is just beginning. I link it to a, a feeling of a sudden drop that you don't anticipate. I link turbulence at night. So I've broken down turbulence in every form from when it starts to it getting worse, walking on the plane when it starts. So I've linked it so many times, so many different ways that from the moment it starts, it's nothing but an inconvenience because I can't get up to use the bathroom. Emotionally, uh, Stress-wise, anxiety-wise, there's absolute zero. You beat this better than the most of the clients I work with. You and I both know you link it to an oxytocin-producing sure. situation that produces uh, a, a, maybe a like for a guy, sexual afterglow moment sure. because you're producing oxytocin, or for a time with a person who you feel completely comfortable with, and that activates the calming system, the parasympathetic nervous system, but when you do that exercise, whichever you're linking to, you said you broke down turbulence into many different pieces. And I'm just wondering if, if what, what are some of the other pieces that you linked those things to? There's different things that you notice that happen with turbulence. First, you may hear uh, the pilot coming on and saying, uh, we're, ladies and gentlemen, I've illuminated the seatbelt sign, uh, expect some rough air. So I'll use that. So I'll imagine Popeye is on a plane and he hears that announcement and uh, he gets worked up because he knows he's going through turbulence now. And I imagine that if I'm using my son as an imagery, um, uh, that, I'm, that my son takes a black and white three by five photo of Popeye, feeling that emotion, holding it to, you know, my son holding the photo of Popeye to his face. I link that image and then go to the next. Now the next thing Popeye might feel is, the anxiousness and he's worked up and um, he starts to feel the plane moving around. So I take that freeze frame as if it was another photograph or a, or a cartoon snippet. And I imagine my son holding that moment up to his face. From there, you'd have different uh, levels of turbulence. So you may have 
continuous light chop. So I imagine that Popeye again is on the plane going through slight chop and the feeling, the sounds. Um, and again, my son holding that image of Popeye close to his face. So I'm linking turbulence in different degrees from beginning, during turbulence, and when the turbulence ends, all like if it was broken up in a movie. So if there was a sequence of Popeye on a plane um, that's about to enter turbulence, that's starting turbulence, that is within turbulence, and that is ended. I link all that piece by piece by piece. So I believe I'm getting continuous shots of oxytocin or the vagus nerve calming effect because I've continuously, while I'm in turbulence, I think I'm getting this relief. Okay, good, good. Um, any other tips? You, you know how I am. I'm very technical. I don't know how many other people are, are uh, on the technical aspect, but I think it helps tremendously uh, for me anyways to know, um, to know about uh, how safe they are because of their redundancies and um, to know the statistics. And, uh, you know, that, that helps a lot. I'd say for me, that's probably 40%, 50% of it. And the rest of it is the training. The training works perfectly with the program. Um, but again, sometimes even now, if the, you, you know, if there's a, a crash in the news that's sensationalized, I would still like to talk about it with you because yeah. I like to sure. know what, uh, what happened. And I don't let it stop me from flying. Obviously, you know that. I just, I just like to know what, what happened and how they'll prevent it and it puts my mind at ease. But as far as the training goes, tips for that, uh, you need to find several different moments uh, is what I found worked for me. Um, you need to do it in a calm, you need to be calm when you do it. You can't be worked up and try to do the training because you already have that anxious feeling. So, so you, need, you need to do this practice well before your flight so that the, I, the yeah. anticipatory anxiety doesn't get in the way of doing the exercise. At least that helps anyway. Sure. So when I first did your program back in the first time I ever flew, I should say the first time I flew after the last time I refused to fly again was in 2009 or 10. Um, and I had done the program for the first time and I didn't know what was going to happen. So I picked a long flight, but I picked one that I could drive back from. I flew to California from New York. You could drive back from California. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Big so job, I said, but let's, you could. Yeah. let's test, let's test this program. I wanted to go to California anyway. So I said, worst case, if it doesn't work, I could drive back. And uh, I, I uh, told you, the first person I called when I landed was you to say, this was amazing. I cannot believe it. Can't believe how awesome it worked. And since then, every subsequent flight is just better and better because you're gaining more material when you fly. Okay, there was that sensation that I felt. I need to link this. Oh, yeah. More things to, to link program. up. Okay. So you, can, you kind of take notes as you go along. During the flight, something gets you. You take that, you add that to the to the mix. Yes. So you can only, you can only imagine what something would feel like. So, you know, step one of the program is to link every routine piece of flight. And, you know, for instance, the airplane rolling down the runway and the sound you hear, well, you can imagine that in your head, but until you actually do it and remember what the feeling was like, that's what you need to link. That's yeah. what you need to link. So then the next time you have that background knowledge and you remember that, okay, you know what, when we were on the takeoff roll, it bothered me because you know, I didn't link that exact sound and feel and rumble, but now I know what it sounds like and what it feels like. So next time I'll link it. So I've gotten to the point now where I don't think there's anything else I can link. I mean, I've, I've, yeah. I've pretty much covered all bases. Um, all right. And it's, so, it's not even routine um, things, but even uh, something that you may be scared of happening that's probably unlikely to happen. If it bothers you, I link it anyway, just so that if, it, if the thought would pop into my head during the flight, it's, it's taken care of. Now, Joe, the other thing that I hear a lot about is anticipatory anxiety. What about that? Uh, it gets better every time. Um, it, it, I, I, if I had to recall, yes, you know, there's been times where the night before, the day before I'd be getting worked up. I think one of the ones where I got worked up on, I remember exactly what it was. Um, it was flying to Italy because it was a long haul over water at night and it was on the Airbus 330 which of course Air France was sensationalized with that crash and I was nervous for a couple days leading up to that flight that was in 2015 um, so for a couple days prior to that I was I was worked up but I said you know what no matter what 
no matter if it kills me, I have decided I'm going to on this trip. I have family in Sicily still. I had been wanting to go to Positano for a long time. I hadn't been back to Italy in years because of the, the, the fear of flying that had set in. So I told myself and committed no matter what I'm going. And I did. And it was probably one of the smoothest flights I've ever had. Um, and that was a huge confidence boost and a huge thing for me to be able to do a long haul on the plane that for whatever reason scared me the most to conquer that and to, to succeed at that was open me up. I could basically go anywhere I want now. So it was, it was well worth uh, the two days of anticipatory anxiety because since 2015, I virtually have had none. Well, what the thing you said there that you just decided you were going to do it no matter what. I've been, <laughs> I've been preaching that. Not everybody yeah. can do it. But what I, what I sometimes say, look, you can have magical thinking. You can believe that hoping is going to make something better. But, you know, I'm not a Sarah Paling fan, but I do love the thing she says. Well, what about that hopey, changey stuff? How's that doing for you? And, and so you could do hopey, changey stuff all you want to about your upcoming flights. not going to change anything except it's going to just make you upset as you approach your flight. And what you – it comes down to this. There's nothing you can do or think or hope or pray that's going to change the flight. And so why do it? Well, because of our magical thinking, we kind of hope that it's going to change something. It's not. And if we can get it, that there's, you know, we don't like to give up control. And so this is a way I think we kind of try to have control by hoping and, and wishing. But when you finally get to the point, which I think you were talking about, where you say, I'm doing it, you realize you have nothing that you can do that's going to change the flight. The only thing you can do is decide, am I going to be on the inside of the door when it closes or the outside of the door with them when it closes, and that's it, and there's nothing else to think about. Absolutely. So I do still say my prayers when I'm on the plane. That's just something I do. However, um, getting to the point when, from the moment I book a flight, to me, that's the point of no return. So even if the flight is four months away, when I book the flight, I'm committed to going, so yeah. that it shuts down any wishy-washy feeling, am I going to go, am I not going to go? From the day I book the flight, I go no matter what. Ah, you're not sitting on the fence. That's an uncomfortable place. So you start, you don't wait until you're halfway through from booking the flight to getting on the flight to try to say, this is the point of no return. When you make that reservation, that's it. That's, that's beautiful. It. That's it. And I noticed that helped a lot because in the past, what I would do was, and this is even after the program, but I've learned now tools that help me um, and hopefully will help other people. You know, if I would book a flight that was three, four months out, I'd say, oh, well, it's down the road. Why worry about it now? So you could, that's one way of looking at it, saying it's three, four months away. Why worry about it now? But the one thing that is a fact, um, every flight I have booked, that's it. Once it's booked, that's it. You, you may be on the fence. Am I really going to go on this trip? Should I go on this trip? Well, yeah, you should go on the trip because every other trip you've taken has been awesome. So that, that question comes in and out of your brain really quick. I decide the airline. I decide what plane I want to fly just because that's what I like to do. It gives me some feeling of control when I say, you know what, I'm going to pick a good airline. And you know what, if I have to uh, drive to Boston or New York to be on the newer model, no big deal. To me, that makes me comfortable. And once I hit purchase, that's it. It's over. I'm going well, no matter what. I, I got to tell you, you're reminding me of, of something. Uh, There's a person who comes on the Wednesday night group phone session a lot. I don't want to mention her name because it's, it's kind of private, but what she, what she does just drives me up the wall. She says, I say to my husband, don't tell me about it. Don't tell me we're going to go <laughs> just make the reservations, but don't tell me, don't say a word. <laughs> and just the day of the flight, you just say, Oh, pack your bag. Let's go with taxis coming in an hour. <laughs> she, yeah. she just does exactly the opposite of what you're doing. Yeah. I, I think that would induce more stress. If I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't have time to prepare and time to, you know, like I said, I allot myself uh, two weeks time before the flight so that I'm not trying to cram in all the training sessions because I do have a lot of material. So it'll take me, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to do the whole, training from routine flight to things that might scare you to feel, you know, so I spend a good amount of time on it, quality time, making sure that the images are clear 
and uh, that I'm not getting revved up while doing it. That's why That's I'll use the point. It. You know, if you get but, revved up while you're doing it, those images sort of take over and make you believe they're really going to happen. So that's why, per your suggestion, uh, when there are flight sequence scenes that may worry you, for instance, an engine exploding or a wing cracking off or a roof ripping, I'll use a black and white image of a cartoon character. The black and white because it takes away the reality of it and the cartoon character because it doesn't create any emotion because you're imagining it happening to yourself or to another human. So that keeps the emotion and the anxiety part at bay. So you can successfully link the images um, of the flight that may be of concern to you to your, to your moment that you're, you're using. Okay, let me kind of run through what I think is a summary of what you're saying. First of all, when you call to make a reservation or do it on the internet, that's a done deal. That's your done. point of no return. You're not gonna change your mind, not gonna back No, up. never have Okay, then from then until the flight, you do the preparation. You right. train your what we call unconscious procedural memory. You go through the things that you know are going to happen on the flight. You link those to an oxytocin producing memory and you link it also to a calming memory such as maybe with your son. Yes. And then when it comes to the, the, the really difficult things, you use cartoons. Now, yes. I, I think you could get by with color cartoons, but you're using black and white cartoons to make sure. Okay, exactly. now what, what happens if you're doing the exercise and you start to feel stressed? Uh, initially, doing? in the beginning, again, going back 10 years ago, uh, I would use the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 if I needed to calm down or I would take a break from it. And what I would do was take myself back to the moment that I was using. For instance, if I'm using a moment with my son, um, let's just say the one image I love is when he was about three or four years old. I was chasing him around a tree during the fall. He was hiding in a leaf pile. and while he was hiding, I hid behind a tree and he popped out and, and, or I popped out behind the tree and he started giggling and laughing. And it was just a great moment. It was just a great bonding moment. Um, and he was just the way he was looking at me. So I used that image, but when you're linking it, um, it's almost like you're, so you live that moment. So I could smell the leaves. I could, I could feel the temperature. I could hear his voice. But then when you're linking him holding up the photo, it's like a still frame. So he's paused, smiling at me, looking at me, holding up the photo. Now, if I would get worked up, what I do is I get rid of the moment that I'm linking, the, the, the moment that's causing me stress, and I pause, I close my eyes, and I go back to living that moment again with my son running around the tree and the leaf pile. That calms me down. And then from there, again, it's a freeze frame as if the movie I'm watching in my head of my son running around the tree is paused and he holds up another picture. Okay, great. Okay, so we got to what you're doing to prepare. Then when you actually get to the airport, you meet the pilots. That is the icing on the cake. And then yes. on the flight, you don't have to do anything, right? I don't have to do anything. On the flight, uh, there's, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't have to take any medication. Never have since day one of doing SOAR. Never took any medication. I, I did have it with me. I had, uh, I had uh, um, anxiety medication with me just in case it would creep up. Never had to use it. This is going back 10 years. After that, I don't even need to bring it anymore because I know that this is proven that I've never needed it. I don't need to drink. I don't need to do anything but pick a movie, talk to my son because he loves – I mean, he's, you've, you've met him. Yeah, he has yeah. a million questions about flying, so I answer all of his questions as best as I can. Um, and, uh, it's come to the point now where, uh, you know, it's exciting again. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, you're going to, uh, a, a new destination or, or a destination you've been to before, but you want to go and some places it's the only way you can get there. Um, others, it's just the most, I could never see myself driving more than four or five hours. So to think that you're, you know, you'd spend 24 hours to drive to Florida or you could be there in two and a half is just, it's ludicrous. So um, you just have to, I've, I've begun to admire the, the technological marvel that, that is flying, um, that is the engineering behind them. And uh, again, I've come to the point now where I can enjoy once I'm on the plane, take off to landing and everything in between. Would I prefer a perfectly smooth flight? Yeah, I think anybody would. But the, the point is here is that no matter the severity of turbulence that I've been in, and I've been in a couple flights 
uh, where even during landing, um, the flight attendants were told uh, they couldn't pick up trash and they, you know, they made announcements, ladies and gentlemen, it's far too rough in the cabin for us to come around. Please hold on to your garbage until after landing. And even then, um, I've had zero anxiety creep up. You know, I was just thinking uh, as we're talking about what's happened, the name of your business, it, it, it seems to fit this too, above and beyond. Yeah, right, right. Why don't you just mention, you know, what that's all about? So what, what we do is um, uh, we rent heavy construction equipment uh, to contractors, builders. Um, imagine a, a crane-like material handlers, uh, forklifts, boom lifts, scissor lifts. Um, so I've been in the construction uh, equipment rental industry since 2003, so 16 years now. Um, but yeah, that, that was a pretty good name. It was, uh, it was, it was fitting. Yeah, you get on one of those bucket lifters and go up to the top of a tree or tell well, well, you know, that's that's the funny thing too. You know, I, I rent and sell this equipment all the time, but I can't go over twenty feet in one. Now flying <laughs> flying doesn't bother me anymore, but going in one of my own machines that I rent out, I still can't cross twenty feet. So <laughs> ah, something for us to work on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I always tell them, you know, I'll rent it to you, I'll sell it to you, but um, as far as going up in it, you know, that's your job, not mine. All right. So <laughs> wonderful. So before we close, anything else you want to throw in about uh, any of this? Uh, like I would tell anyone, like I've mentioned to people before, uh, if you want to fly, if you have, if you don't, if you're not flying, you absolutely need to do this. If you're flying uncomfortably, you should do this because there's a lot of people that fly that have to take medication or have to drink and they're uncomfortable the whole time. And uh, on my last trip, I was flying with uh, uh, a buddy of mine who uh, hates to fly, but still hasn't done anything about it. Now, he'll ask me questions because he knows I have, you know, this background knowledge from speaking with you and, um, and because I've been doing it. But, uh, you know, he still had to take uh, his Xanax and a, a couple cocktails on the plane to make it through the flight. And I'm just looking at him like, if you would just do the program, you'd be fine. Um, so anybody who's questioning, is it going to work? Is it not? I mean... I think your success numbers speak for themselves. You've been, you've been talked about on many news stations. You have this successful book, the second one that just came out. Um, Panic. It's a leap. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yep. It's a, it's a leap of faith. Um, the, the, the quote uh, that, I, that was driving for me was, you'll never live if you're too afraid to die. So make the commitment. Uh, learn about the statistics. Uh, learn about how safe it is. Learn about how in the United States – We've been, what, 16 plus years accident free on major airlines um, and do the program. Uh, if you're not flying, do the program. Take, uh, take a, a two hour flight, an hour flight, just as a tester like I did going to California. And uh, I could probably guarantee you that uh, you'll have no problem with the flight and you'll be flying back the same way you came. And if you are flying uncomfortably, do the program because if you're already flying, but you're flying uncomfortably, this will, in my opinion, 100% cure you. Yeah, and, and sometimes people worry about that incredibly small risk. And here your friend is using Xanax and alcohol, which is right. crazy because what right. it can do is it can go to the part of the brain that regulates breathing and shut it down. Sure. You better tell him don't do that. Oh, yeah. Well, sure. you know, I did, I did check on him a couple of times throughout the flight. and, and uh, I said, you know, I'm over here enjoying the flight and your head is uh, bouncing on the, on the side of the wall here every time we're hitting a bump. I said, you, you really got to, you know, you really got to do this program and uh, understand everything. And even for him, someone who doesn't like to fly and uh, was worked up about it, just because he took that flight and, you know, I was talking him through certain movements and motions and what was happening on his return flight, he did that much better. And that was just with the knowledge. Uh -huh. Now imagine if he actually does the program and links everything. It's, uh, yeah, that's right. Because what we want to do is to set it up in what we call unconscious procedural memory, just so everybody knows what it is. When you drive your car, when you first drove it, you had to pay attention. You had to really concentrate. But after you've done it for a while, it, it becomes sec second nature. And how does it do that? It goes into a part of the brain called unconscious procedural memory. And that lets you drive the car on autopilot. What we want right. to do is have the practice that you do as you approach your flight 
uh, go into unconscious procedural memory so that the links that you use as you do that practice are active during the flight and do two things, prevent the release of stress hormones. And the other thing is to activate the calming system that takes care of us. Okay. And that's, an, that's another thing that some people question and, and uh, maybe it's not that clear, but when I explain to uh, other fearful flyers about your program and, and how it works, they often ask me, well, what do you need to do on the plane? And I tell them, sit down, absolutely <laughs> nothing. That's so they think that maybe with, with the training, you need to recall this while you're flying or, or you need to meditate on something. No, once, once this is all stored uh, in your brain, uh, this training is complete. It's automatic. You don't have to do anything but take your seat. Yeah, Joe, you know, sometimes uh, people will say, what am I supposed to do during a panic attack? In fact, in fact, the publicist for the new book, Panic Free, was saying, I'd like for me to do an article about what do you do in the middle of a panic attack? You can't do anything. You're overloaded. So right. you, you, what you've got to do is do the preparation before so you don't have the panic attack. Right. And, and let alone panic attack. But if I can fly with absolute zero anxiety, zero, yeah. none, um, there's other things that would cause more anxiety in daily life uh, than taking a flight for me at this point. So um, it's, it's remarkable. It works. You just have to, you, like anything else, you have to put the time in. You have to do the preparation. Um, I still, you know, usually, uh, I think you say after the initial, uh, training, you just need to do a warm ups a couple, two or three times prior to a flight. I still do six to eight just to make sure I'm covered mm -hmm. and it's worked every time. So why change something, okay. uh, that's, that's been successful for me and your program's phenomenal. If anyone has any questions, um, you're the best to answer them, but I hope they've gained, uh, maybe, uh, some clarity on how I perform the training because it has worked. Uh, so very well for me. Great. And I really want to thank you for that detail on turbulence because I think it's going to make a big difference to people as Good. well as the fact that anticipatory anxiety, the real key is deciding you're going to do it or not do it, whichever it. it is, whether you decide to do it or not do it. Fine. But just make that decision. From the moment I click buy, that's it. There's no back and forth. There's no reason to be anxious about it. You booked it. You, you made the decision. You chose the airline, the time that you're leaving, where, you know, these are all decisions that you made. Now stick to your guns and, and go through with it. And the feeling you get when you land is of such satisfaction and yeah, I did it. I'm here. Well, I'm just curious, is that also the approach you do in business? Yes. When I make up my mind, when I have done, when there's decisions that need to be made, should this item be purchased? Should that be sold? Is this what we're going to set at our price for this market for the season? I do all my homework. Um, I ask all the questions I need to ask. I do the research. And once I decide on something, I don't go back and forth. It's an, it's an executive decision and it's final. And if I made a mistake, that's on me. But if you've done the preparation and you've done uh, the work, usually you're, you're going to make the right decision. So, um, you know, people, I jog. I jog uh, several times per week. That's way more dangerous than, than uh, being on a plane. You could be hit by a car. People are texting at all times now. They don't see you. But I'm making the decision to go for a jog. I can live with it. So the same way I look at that, I look at flying now. I'm making the decision to book this flight. It's going to happen. I'm going to go. And that, that truly does alleviate a lot of the stress. Because if you book it and you're going to worry about it for the next couple of months or three months or a couple of weeks, it's not doing anything for you. If you were talking to somebody who they're in the middle of that anticipatory anxiety as their flight's coming up, what would you say? Pretty much the same thing that, that I'm saying now. I mean, you, you, I, would, I would give them the statistics. I would tell them, uh, you know, you made the decision to go, so just go. I mean, you, 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 worrying about the flight right now is not going to change its outcome. That plane is still going to do probably 2,000 flights, that very plane, before you even board it. Uh, so nothing you're worrying about right now or your what ifs aren't going to have any impact on the outcome of that flight. So you made the decision, just go with it because I'm sure, uh, you're going to have a great time when you get to your destination and then you'll have great memories and things to talk about on your return. What's your next trip? You know, we want to be back in Italy next year and I haven't seen my family. I still have family in Sicily. 
Had I booked that already, I would be telling you I am going to Sicily next year. Got it. It's on. It's on the. It's on the horizon. It's on the scope. But uh, no, once once something is booked, it's committed. So as of right now, I have zero flight commitments. But once I do book something, it's a go. Okay. The difference between plan and commitment. You can take the commitment to the bank. Got it. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much, Joe. All right. This is Thank great you. Stuff. Take care. All right. See you later. All right. We'll see you.